thanks, uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, good afternoon and welcome, everyone. I'm very excited uh, for the last session uh, of Marine Money today, and I am very proud to be able to speak with four esteemed leaders from the dry box sectors, while representing the large, the medium, and the small, to talk about the dry box frenzy which I think is a very welcome topic today. Um, and I can see smiles on the screen already um, since uh, a couple of minutes ago. Um, I, I think a, a big question about it is about uh, how long it would stay or how, how high it will go. But before we go on those, um, I, I can see uh, JM now. Um, I, I would like to just start with my first question. First, uh, uh, to, to Khalid and perhaps JM. Um, mm -hmm. is that we are now 12 months in recovery. Things are looking rather good. Um, demand is strong, the fleet is slow, earnings are high. Um, this is the best over the, the, the past decade. Yesterday, we, we heard a, a few factors which contributes to this um, from COVID rebound, hot congestion, stimulus package and all that. But I would like to really deep dive into this granularities about from, from your point of view, what exactly is driving this performance? And I would like to hear both from Khalid and JM. Perhaps Khalid could represent the uh, uh, a small bulkers and then we, we go on with JM to hear about what's happening in the, in the large. So I've got this uh, slide up for you here. So what is the slide showing you? It's showing you the last 10 year average rates per day per ship in all the four sectors of the dry bulk market. And if you see and look at the change quarter over quarter, you see a very surprising trend. Uh, most shipping people would say that quarter three is always a weak quarter. But if you look at this slide, it shows you at least rates have gone up quarter over quarter without fail. And it doesn't matter which size sector you're in. Now, if you see what's happened in the first three quarters, and here I'm limited in the third quarter up to the end of August. So if you look at that and see quarter two over quarter one was a huge jump, and it doesn't matter which part of the market you're looking at. And if you look at the data up to the end of August, and of course, in September, the data is even stronger. But if you look at it just to the end of August, then this is what it shows you in terms of rates going up. So it's been an amazing ride that you could call it uh, that we've seen. Now, I want to show you another slide and give you the four reasons why ordering has been quite constrained because normally ship owners go crazy when, or when, when the market goes up like this. So if you look at the BDI and look at 2021 and compare it to 2020 and 2019, you see that the BDI has gone up by 230% over last year and about 152% over 2019. At the same time, if you look at the total number of ships ordered in the first half of 2021, you see 14 million delivery tons of ships were ordered versus 10.2 in 2020 and 15 in 2019. So overall, if you see it like that, then 2021 over 2020 was 37.1% up and over 2019 was down by 7%. If you broke that down into the smaller ships, that's the geared sector and the gearless sector, then you see something quite different. You see that the order book actually has come down by 45% compared to 2020 in 2021 and 35% as compared to 2019. So in the smaller sector, it seems there has been a more constrained response than in the larger sector. And in the larger sector, you can see it here, 110% over 2020 and 3.6% over 2019. But keep in mind, no matter what these percentages show you, these are all time lows since records were kept by Clarkson's on the uh, order book to fleet ratio. So the four reasons for this to come down are just simple, that the 12 year drought in rates, the container tankers and gas ships crowding out uh, and booking all the slots available. Uh, and if you look at this statistic, it's more interesting. Uh, there are 89 shipyards within China, Japan, and South Korea. They delivered 433 dry bulk carriers in 2022. The forward order book is just 572 ships all the way to 2025. And compared to the 261 ships, which shipyards which were there in China, 
uh, Japan and South Korea, which delivered 1,569 ships in 2011. So if you compare these two numbers, you, you can see why we are constrained in ordering because number of shipyards has come down and the capacity to deliver has also shrunk quite considerably. And of course, current legislation. So these are the uh, items that have uh, really caused uh, the market to have gone uh, the way it has. And I factor as well which is a combination of the four factors you mentioned about the supply and that is basically the big spread especially on the larger capes uh, the big spread between the second hand and the new building so uh, right now i mean to build a ship that will likely be redundant or partly redundant in a few years uh, you need about 55 to 60 million or even more uh, at the same time you can buy a high quality second hand ship for 35 and effectively make exactly the same return so i don't see how someone in his right mind is going to build new buildings today where you have I'm not going to say ample, but you have uh, plenty of ships being sold or offered to be sold at a much lower price. So I agree 100%. And I think that the environmental regulations as a combination, not only um, for, uh, you know, the vessel of tomorrow, but also what's going to happen in uh, 23 and onwards, which, uh, you know, we'll have a chance to discuss about it later. I think this is going to have a huge effect on the rates as well. So thank you. Thanks, thanks, Tamar. So I'll, I'll shift gear a little bit. So we hear uh, the order book um, uh, demand and orders is, is kind of driving what has happened. Uh, I'll direct my next question to um, Jem is back online and Martin, yeah. right? Um, well, I, I, I have been seeing some indicators shifting a little bit. Uh, consumption moving from goods to service. Some say it. Um, I, in fact, Kelvin uh, earlier in the session mentioned that. Um, and COVID-led fleet efficiency, well, at least in my mind, I think it would have to correct by itself at some point. So do you think, are you concerned or do you think that things would be uh, slow things down going forward? What's your view in the next? That congestion for Capes and Panamax is at a, between 30 and 50 percent higher than its five-year average. The last thing on the supply side is also, coincidentally, you actually, at least for coal and iron ore, you have more ton miles um, because the way, the, just the way the world's working, uh, you have to move your cargo from a farther distance. Um, then moving to the demand side, you have massive, and this kind of covers your question, you have massive stimulus package issues by governments. Well, it's done. It's mostly been for infrastructure. What it's done is it's, um, it's increased global steel production. We're about 12% up um, year to day. And in China, we're up 9%. And that means more demand for coal and more demand for coking coal and more demand for iron ore. And it's not just China. We have iron ore imports into the EU, Japan, and South Korea up 20 million, 21 million tons a year on year. And then on the coal side, you have Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, India, and the EU experiencing post uh peak pandemic rebounds in demand for that commodity too. So you put this all together and it's a very bullish picture. Uh, their uh, rate pickup, which is happening right now. And then we saw with the tankers last year and all the storage, those rates went to almost $400,000 a day. So I, I think it would be, um, it, it takes a brave man to bet that you won't see rates that will, uh, that will surprise us all to the upside. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jim. Martin, uh, what do you think about sky is the limit? The basis, if we take our hand, is uh, we're not a million miles off what the so-called all-time high from 2008. Uh, Supras have a little bit further to go. Uh, and yes, the, who knows how high it can go. In, in terms of, I think people read too much into, is there a slowdown in China? Is the world changing? People have to, people have to be employed. It is going to be infrastructure. Um, I keep on being quoted, it's not just in time, it's just in case stockpiles. The world has changed. Uh, COVID, if, if Asia decides to live with it, as Europe is starting to do, that, that, then yes, I think we'll move forward. But I think we're a little way away from that. So inefficiencies are, are there. On the smaller sizes, we love the container market because 30, 40 years ago, too much bulk went from, uh, from bulk carriers into containers. That's now coming back out again. 
which tends to be long haul, uh, put ships at sea. It's almost the perfect storm. So, yeah, but it does annoy me. It was like, like the Guinea situation last week. All the paper boys all sold it off. Oh, my God, Guinea, no more bauxite. It's nonsense. Even five times. And, you know, at the same time, people just have absorbed this increase, of course. So suddenly from an X amount uh, per container, let's say three or four or five thousand dollars, it's gone up to twenty thousand dollars. So that's a big multiple. At the same time, at the same time, you have the average per ton cost of iron ore and coal hasn't even gone up like uh, twice. So, you know, I can't really see how the world cannot absorb a higher transportation cost which, of course, it's going to translate into freight transportation. I mean, everything else has increased substantially, but at the same time, for a weird reason for, for which I, uh, I, I anticipate it's not going to last for too long, the market is suppressed on the freight level, uh, you know, quite significantly. I think this is going to end soon. And like Michael and the Martin and Khalid uh, has said, I think we will see the sky <laughs> become the next day. Very well. I uh, I hear a lot of uh, positive sentiments there. Um, now, shifting gear a little bit, I, I think the challenging part is now solved with uh, money flowing in, cash flow generated. How are you going to use your profits and cash for the coming months and years? Are you thinking about investments since there's uh, the whole decarbonization going around? Um, research, um, uh, you know, dividends back to the shareholders, deleverage. What's your plan? And more importantly, um, when you make the decision, uh, what are your considerations? Um, well, let, let me start. I'll tell you what we are not going to do, and I would recommend this for everyone, order new buildings. Um, that would just be the worst thing. And I just like to say that it is not a zero sum game in the tri cargo freight market, right? We can make the freight buy bigger and we should. And the best way to do that is not oversupplying our own market. So we would definitely not look at new buildings and we wouldn't. And then if you want to just take that out and you're only worried about your own competitive advantage, well, a new building's more expensive. A new building, you don't have a line of sight to what your earnings are, i.e. you can't buy one as like a secondhand ship and fix it in the period market. And um, they, sorry. And um, yeah, and, and they're cheaper. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to me to order any new buildings. And then as far as the new fuel source goes, well, we haven't figured that out yet. So why don't we just wait for that to happen and then we can order new buildings. And, and, and then we can deal with what the new type of ship is. In the meantime, we should be um, harvesting our ships as much as possible. I would probably, if I, if we didn't have any ships, I would definitely be buying um, uh, dry cargo ships right now. And probably the cave sizes are the most undervalued. Um, but again, uh, the one thing that I would not do is order new buildings. I, I, I think. You're kidding yourself if you think you're going to have a competitive advantage. And all you're going to manage to do is to destroy your own market. So let's not do that this time, please. Could, could I go next to you, Amy, just quickly? Yeah, please, Mark. Uh, we're publicly quoted NASDAQ. And, and yes, it's a glorious position. My, my CFO for years, you know Steve very well, was always concerned where the money was coming from. Now it's the other way around. What are we going to do with the money? We're in a very good position. But absolutely what J.M. said, new buildings, forget it. Um, half the panel is from a country I, I, I admire immensely. I've been 44 years in the business, Greeks. I like the philosophy, deleverage, redu reduce your cost down, make your balance sheet absolutely bulletproof. Obviously, as we've announced, we're going to become dividend paying, and we have a number of long-term charters with attractive purchase options. So I, I think on the whole, for a number of us, our bets have been placed. And we now enjoy the market, but no way new buildings, reduce leverage, and and who knows when the market is again. We'll know that after. But but at the end of the day, I think we all learnt from from the uh, the two thousands. People get carried away, and it's when you hear those immortal words, "It's different this time and a new paradigm," and then we can start to get scared. But at the moment, let's print the money and enjoy it. I mean, can't can't disagree with both the both GM and Martin. Uh, 
just like uh, GM said, we already have enough ships. Uh, we've invested at the right time of the cycle. We've got some reasonably cheap ships with us. Now we want to harvest the, 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 the funds that we sold in the past and get the returns on it. And for that, uh, we would use the money to basically pay out dividends to the shareholders. So you must remember with precious shipping, we've uh, paid out uh, between 2004 and 2014, almost 42 consecutive quarterly dividends. And then between the middle of 2014 and the middle of this year, we have not paid any dividends. So seven years of a hiatus and maybe a 10, 11 year uh, string of quarterly uh, dividends. And we already started after quarter two with a big uh, quarterly dividend out. So we think that uh, we will use the funds for that. Then we don't need to invest in ships. We will deliver the balance sheet, uh, but we've got now fairly long-term loans and we don't want to uh, you know, uh, remove them completely. We've just taken those loans uh, uh, so it doesn't make sense to try and wipe them out too early. But uh, yes, uh, we would deliver the balance sheet. We would pay out uh, dividends to shareholders. And uh, as the other uh, speakers have said, uh, we will harvest what we have sold. I, um, I agree as well, yeah. uh, as I may say. Um, returns to shareholders are a top priority and should be top priority for um, our companies because they have suffered a lot uh, the previous years. Uh, we have suffered a lot the previous years. Uh, you know, we have had a very, very bad market. So now it's time to show the real taste uh, of returns finally to our shareholders. So that's a top priority. At the same time, we should be considering uh, to invest on the existing ships uh, with energy saving devices and whatever we can. And we are doing that in partnership with the charters in order to make ships more efficient and have the impact of the new regulations to be as minimal as possible. I know that you know there, there are so many things in question now about energy efficiency and energy saving devices, but we are doing this aggressively on every dry dock we install various energy saving devices on board our ships, not because uh, we want to save, make the ships more efficient, but it's for the best of the environment as well. So right now with the cash flow coming, it's a minimal cost and I think that we all should be considering making the ships more efficient. Thanks, thanks, Damaris here. Uh, Jem, un unless you, you like to add on on that, uh, I, I bet you, you probably wouldn't disagree um, and with, with that either. I, I, I don't. Um, and being, well, for me, a, a significant shareholder in, in um, a lot of the businesses that we're running at CTM, I, I couldn't agree more. I think the shareholders and the ship owners now should deserve this kind of a market. And I honestly believe at the bottom of my heart that if we don't order a lot of ships and we actually take this market uh, into our hands, we, we will be able to generate generational wealth in the next couple of years. So wouldn't you rather have that than, than to go to another naming ceremony? Could, could I ask the panel here, have, have anyone thought about cashing in? I mean, asset price is fantastic. If uh, you know, if I, I I would like to return some uh, you know dividends to my shareholders, selling my asset is Amy, is probably Amy, the the quickest way. Amy, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Uh, <laughs> you, you, the return you'd get from selling a ship, you can never ever capture. Uh, even in a single year's earnings, you can make more money than that. So it doesn't make sense to do that. So nobody's going to be selling a ship to cash out. Uh, to pay dividends. That's not the thing. You, the only reason why you would sell a ship is that she's become very old. If you have such a, a ship in your fleet, yes, uh, maybe after a year, after this year, next year, maybe you think of getting rid of it at that point, but not earlier than that, even for the oldest ship in your fleet. And that's the reason why, if you look at these uh, recycling market, it's come down to zero. No dry bulk ships are being recycled. Everyone agree with that, Top? Yeah, seems like I see nodding of uh, heads over there. So I'll, I'll shift it to a little bit more controversial uh, question now on iron ore and 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 coal. Um, I, I suppose it's not complete uh, without touching a little bit on ESG. Um, it, feel free, anyone who likes to 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 comment on this is that. Uh, uh, with regulations coming on tighter and tighter, what's how, how should we think about um, transporting 
iron ore and coal. Are, are you concerned at all? Let me let me give you one thought. You know, and I, and I get particularly pissed off with the European Union uh, <laughs> because they 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 do such hypocritical stuff that I, I'm really upset, and I want to just speak my mind out on this one. Uh, they have included shipping in the uh, carbon trading scheme in the European Union. Okay, uh, you know, emission trading scheme, and that is fine. I have no issues with that. Then why is the livestock industry, which contributes 9.9% of greenhouse gases compared to all of shipping at 2.4%, why are they? Why is the sacred cow of livestock in the European Union not challenged and not been given a, uh, as begin a free pass, free out of get out of jail card? Why? They should stop them first, not us. So this is my first thing. Second thing is that if you look at the Germans today, they are buying more coal. Because it's cheaper than buying gas, despite paying the carbon emission uh, tra trading uh, tax, despite the ETS, they can still uh, they can still uh, make sense with uh, with coal in power. So for them to talk one thing and do another thing tells me that economics will always trump out everything else, and politics will take precedence even over economics. So politics comes into play when it's the sacred cow of the livestock industry because they are the voters who keep them in power. They'll never ever uh, get you know tax them or uh, stop that industry. So this is one. Secondly, on coal, it makes sense economically. So why would they worry? What I'm trying to get at is that economics finally trumps everything. So every time you see someone saying that the debt of King Coal is on the horizon, please remember what Mark Twain said. He said that the rumors of my death are greatly exaggerated. And I think that that's exactly what applies to coal. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and the German, the German thing is true, too. There's a lot of hypocrisy. Um, I've talked about them in the past um, basis, basis, the ESG thing. And it's exactly right. Uh, coal is a reality in the world we live in. It's a very cheap source. Of energy, you still have 800 million people on planet Earth that don't have heating and energy. So, I, I, I first of all, I think it's wrong to just say, "Well, they can't have coal," as as we had it in the past. And um, going further, I think I think it makes sense economically. I think economics trump, uh, pun intended, uh, <laughs> trump the environment right now. And just to dive down into coal, I mean thermal. Still accounts for 85% of India's power generation, 72% of China's. And to replace it with hydropower is very difficult. I mean, in the People's Republic of China, their energy production is up 14% and their is actually down due to uh, environmental reasons. Um, so I think we've got coal and we've got iron ore for the future to live with. Um, and that's a reality. We don't make the world we live in. We yeah. just have sailed sailed down the river of time with uh, using our experience. And Fantastic. Just I was going to say that coal is not necessarily like uh, a dirty source of energy. I mean, there are about thirty new coal fire plants, coal fire, uh, coal fired uh, power plants being delivered in Asia in Q3 and Q4 alone, new factories, you know, to produce energy with scrubbers and all that. There's no emissions out there. So it's not necessarily a bad energy. You know, like JM said before, you need all this energy. If you want to build all these electric cars, how are you going to move them? You know, it's impossible to all this energy uh, consumption, which is required to be covered just by hydro and the wind alone. And the other hypocrisy here, which I may add about, uh, especially the German market, is that in 2022, all the nuclear factories in Germany will need to close. So the actual closing date of the nuclear factories in, in, in Germany is 2022. Do you know where the coal fire, uh, coal fired power plants are going to close in Germany? In 2037. So talk about hypocrisy here, you know. So even in Germany, in the center of Europe, they will continue using coal for another 15, 16 years. Can, can, sorry, Andy, can I just add? Can I just add just quickly on, on the coal front, just, just as a, a, an addition. At the moment, the latest figures are uh, Chinese coal stockpiles are rather low. They've got 12 days supply. India has six days supply. Fine. 
So I suspect that we could be in for uh, continued coal imports and uh, it could be quite a nice fillet for the market. So, so yeah, one day coal might disappear like oil, but I think at the moment it's here to stay. It's cheap. Keep the lights on. And, and as, as, as Tomati says, new plants, clean technology. Yeah, we, we, we kind of move forward. Thanks. Thanks for that, uh, for the views and iron ore and coal. Um, I think we just have a couple of minutes left. Just quickly round up uh, the table here. Uh, instead of asking how high and how long, I'll ask, what is the one thing in your mind as CEO of well-respected shipping companies constantly in your mind over the last 12 months? What's, what is it? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go here. Uh, the well-being of our seafarers, period. That has been the biggest concern during this, mar uh, during as always is, but especially during COVID. Those guys are on the front line and we are the arteries to the global economies. And, and those guys are really what's, dri what's driving through the, the arteries and humanity takes precedence over everything in my mind. So for me, it's the cruise. I would, I would tend to agree with uh, JM, uh, not only just cruise, but see, for the cruise, you also need to get them jabbed. And that is something yep. which is a real problem. You know, the country that I live in, unfortunately, Thailand, uh, the jab rollout has been very, very slow. And the jabs that have been rolled out have been the type that require a lot of boosters all the time. So really speaking, uh, you know, maybe they didn't get the vaccination rollout correct. They got the initial handling of COVID correct, messed up on the vaccination rollout went into a deep dive in terms of, uh, of infections, and now they're coming back again. So we are trying to get everybody vaccinated. And I think this is the key. The, the, the key is to get the screw safe. And the best way we can get them safe is to get them dead. The second thing, again, I want to point out, and again, the hypocrisy of the governments of this world. You know, the MLC, the Maritime Labor Convention, is signed up by every country in the world. Not a single one really honors it. Because if they did, they would allow my officers and crew to get off at every place that they are in yep. and be able to fly back. They don't. So again, the hypocrisy, you know, which is which is what I want to really point out. You know, people talk badly about shipping, but they never see how bad their governments are. And I think this is something that we need to get home and across. You know, unfortunately, I think we are, we are, we are preaching to the uh, to the to the people who already know this. Unfortunately, this message never seems to get out into the real world press or the mainstream media. It's only in the shipping press. And that's the unfortunate part because the mainstream media never reaches out to people like us where we can make an, a, a cogent statement you know, to them and, and explain to them why is it that shipping is this important and why is it that our seafarers are so important and why is it that you must honor your commitments to the MLC and, and let my officers and crew go. They don't, and that is a big, big issue. So that's what I would like to add. I agree absolutely with GM, but I think that we need to get them jabbed as quickly as possible, and we need certainly to allow them to travel. I, I couldn't agree more, and I've experienced the same thing. Couldn't agree more. Martin, Martin Stamaris? 100%. One thing I mean, in your mind, it, it, yeah. It, it, it's the same thing. It's ongoing. I mean, with, with the cruise, uh, you know, we we we, have, we get the list through every week. If they've been on board six, seven months, how the hell do we get them off? It's the planning. It, it's it's a major logistics uh, nightmare. And and after 100 percent what Khalid said, I mean, we're we're not helped, but we still make it work. And uh, and you can't just force crews to stay on board 12, 15 months. Uh, that's nuts. So uh, so that is the thing. The rest of the market, yes, obviously delays and congestion all, all helps the market. But fundamentally, you want a ship to perform safely. The crew have got to be happy. They've got to be fit and you can't trap them on board. So it's, it's a major headache. Mr. Maris? I, I couldn't agree more. I think that, uh, you know, certain governments are torturing our good people on board the ships uh, in various ways, uh, not allowing them to disembark and to leave to their countries. And that has created uh, a derivative problem because... A lot of people are now exiting, uh, you know, the, the, the seagoing uh, profession. I mean, we have had people that decided not to go on board the ships as long as COVID is there. And these are some good people. You know, if instead uh, of uh, four to six months, you leave your family for a year or 15 or 16 months, you go crazy. So 
a lot of these people are now deciding, if not to exit, to at least postpone their employment in shipping. And that, you know, we miss some very, very good people. That's a big problem. Thank you very much. I think um, uh, I, I, I think uh, we probably wouldn't have uh, much time left, um, but uh, I think we have a uh, very good discussion. Uh, I, I can't realize that how time passes and I have more questions here, but uh, I think we couldn't go through every single of it. So I thank you, all the panelists here, Khalid, Martin, Stamaris and JN uh, for this session. And I hope everyone enjoyed the session. Thank you. Thank Over you to you, you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Amy. Thank you very much. And thank you to the panel. It was a great discussion. Very pleasant to be talking about positive markets. Uh, we, we very much hope that we'll meet again uh, a year from now in person, in physical, and we hope that the market conditions will still be the same at that time. Uh, so that, that actually brings us to the end of, of uh, our conference. This is the last session. So thank you to everybody listening who has been uh, joining us. Uh, thank you to Stand the Chat and our partner sponsor. We yeah, think the rate will be better in a year. Better still, fantastic. <laughs> thank you to our partner Stand the Chat and to all of our uh, other sponsors. Uh, and thank you to you all. And uh, see you again uh, sometime soon. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.